Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mildred, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. My home group is the Rocks Glen Traditional. We meet Mondays and Thursday nights, and if you're in Toronto, please do give me a call. I would be happy to take you to my home group because it is the life stream of AA that comes to me through that group. Um, my dry date, I surprised, well, I guess it's my dry date, too. It's uh, May the 18th, 1973, and for that I'm eternally grateful. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm getting better or if the speakers are, but I have had an unbelievable weekend. I, I'm not sure I can continue it, but my goodness, I've been sitting on that chair and I don't think I've, I haven't been distracted or unengaged for five seconds. I wanted to hear everything that was going on. It was so exciting and so true. And because it's all about what I believe, it's really good. (laughs) I'm not going to, you know, mention the speakers individually, except two of my heroes, Tom and Clancy, who are here. Tom, who said one time, I don't know, this was about... 15, 18 years ago, we were speaking at a conference, and he said, and I don't know if anybody else heard it, but I heard it. He said, um, I had plans for my life. And he, he may not have said it in these exact words, but he said, those plans that I had for my life didn't work out, but he said, there's been a hand that has guided me and has taken me where it is I need to go. Do you remember that, Tom? I heard it, and that's what I'm here to talk about. The plans I had for my life, many of them haven't worked out, and those that did caused me trouble. Imagine that. (laughs) But there has been a hand that has guided me, so that when I stand up here this morning, I have something important for me to say about Step 10 and 11. It may not be for you, but it is for me. And then, of course, I can't, you know, do this without mentioning Clancy, who has been in my life since I was about four years sober. And much of the guidance that I have received, much of the information that I have received that has been helpful to me and that has kept me on a straight and narrow path has come from you, Clancy. And I always want to acknowledge that. I love you dearly and respect you with all my heart. Clancy did, I remember one of the first times I heard him speak. I sat and laughed that, honest to God, I felt sick when the talk was done. I had never laughed like that in my life, I think. And there's a a CD that, I don't know, I'm sure it's still available. It's a talk he gave on the disease of perception. If you're new and you haven't heard that, I would recommend that you hear that. It's fabulous. So, I've thought a lot about what it is that I might say and how honest I'm prepared to be. (laughs) Honest about certain details of my life. Uh, in I think when I was 25 years old, Bill Wilson wrote to Carl Jung to thank him for the contribution he had made to Alcoholics Anonymous through the, t- through the work that he had done with Roland Hazard, and Clancy referred to that last night. In his reply, Carl Jung said something which stunned me when I read it the first time. He said that he always knew that, or he always believed that alcoholics were seeking the spirit with a capital S in every bottle of spirits. 
And I said, bingo. And that explains me, and that explains the the un, unholy direction my life took for a while. Um, I di- my life didn't work, and I knew it by the time I was three. I took a drink when I was five, and that opened the, the, the gate, floodgates of my alcoholism. And it was from then on, for the next 35 years, that I would do anything I possibly could to get that unnatural reaction that Dr. Silkworth referred to as um, a sense of ease and comfort. The problem with a sense of ease and comfort is that it doesn't last. It's not real. It's just a sense. And so from that, I guess I can look at my alcoholism and say what I really was seeking was not another drink. What I was seeking really was the spirit. And it has taken a while for me to totally understand that and to really understand what step 10 and 11, what part they really play in my life. You know, it's interesting to me when Chuck Chamberlain came into my life. I came into A the first time in 1966. I was in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Chuck Chamberlain came. He used to come to see Cease and to come to that big roundup. And the, one of the first things he said to me was, you think your problem is drinking alcohol. He said, you've got problems because you drink alcohol. But he said, you've got problems because you think you're separate from God. And because you think you're separate from God, you have problems with your fellow man and you have problems with yourself. Bingo. He said it all. I didn't believe him. I didn't, I didn't know the importance of that. But that idea has come back to me over and over and over again. So I'm going to talk about step 10 and 11, but to really, I think, really speak about it properly, I have to give you some idea of how I tried to manage my life and the results I got and why I am so stuck on 10 and 11 and what 10 and 11 has done for me. I was born on a farm in Saskatchewan. I, we were Roman Catholic. I was the baby of 10. And, yeah, we were Roman Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and I was born into a great family. I was born into a family of integrity. But I didn't like my family. And I didn't like them for this reason. Early on, I was about three, when somebody started to crawl into my bed, and she would cry. It was my sister who at that time they said was retarded. I was three. She was 16. She'd been injured at birth. She couldn't learn as fast as the other kids. The educational system at that time didn't know what to do with her. They kept her in grade three till she was 16. She was 16 at the time. The kids in the school made fun of her. Her name was Dorothy. They called her Dora, and some of them called her Dumb Dora. And she would cry at night, and she would crawl into my bed because, you know, when I think about that, sometimes I still feel like crying. And my goal in life came became to stop her crying. Well, where am I going to go? I'm going to go to those big brothers and sisters who have pampered me all along. And they didn't fix it. <clears throat> I didn't understand. Can I have a half a glass of water, please? Otherwise, I'll have to stop and go to the bathroom. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I misunderstood. And I was raised in a family where we didn't discuss stuff. You know, 70, 75 years ago, families weren't out on television, you know, telling their deep, dark secrets to the whole public. We didn't. T- and so I made my conclusion. I made the, I, I, what I believed was, I guess I made a mistake. I'm not important. Nobody cares about me. Life is scary. Be careful. Because if you get a problem, nobody looks after you. And that's how my personality, you talked about that yesterday, Katie. That's how my personality and my modus operandi was formed. Now we went to church. 
and the priest talked about God. And I don't ever remember the priest saying that God was mean. What I heard him say, you know, isn't it amazing how we hear what we need to sit here? I heard him say that God was love and power. And I thought, I've got my answer. Here, God, you fix my sister. This is part of my step 10 and 11. As one of the Jesuits said to me, God heard you, and God did, but not on your time. Because nothing immediate happened. Dora continued to cry. I continued to cry, and I grew into a sad and angry and despairing child, full of fear. And then I took a drink. I should say, God became to me, I wasn't angry at God. I don't know, you know, it just seemed to me I did believe that there was something, but a useless kind of twit, you know? I mean, if you ask God to do something that seems very good and God doesn't do it, what use is that? That became very important to me when I was 20 years sober. Make no mistake. Some of those old ideas have to be changed, and they aren't changed from out there. They're changed in here when we're ready to see different and do the work. I took a drink at five, and I was an alcoholic from the word go. And for the next 35 years, that's what I chased, that unnatural reaction, that unnatural relief and good feeling that I got when I put that stuff into me. And it really seems to me that in one sense, I stopped growing at that point, not intellectually, but emotionally and in my ability to cope, because whether it took lying, cheating, manipulation, harming you, I was willing to do all that to get that good feeling. I'm smart, and but I never fit. God, you know, I spent a lifetime wanting to fit and always feeling on the outside. And uh, the the only time I ever felt I fit was when I was half in the bag. And so that's what I chased. Uh, when I, I graduated high school when I was 14. And again, I was always younger than the other kids. I didn't fit there. And when I left high school, I wanted to go to university and be a lawyer, but I was scared. You know, for years, I wouldn't admit this. I was afraid. I'm, I'm that frightened little girl. Life is scary, and nobody helps me if I've got a problem. I'm going to leave the farm, and I'm going to go to the big city, to a university, and tackle everything. Not possible. So what I did was I took a little job as a receptionist at the hospital, and I knew that isn't where I belonged. So uh, when I was 18, by that time, everything had simply escalated in my life. I decided I'm going to a convent, and when they said they didn't want me, I said, somebody's going to find me. The swinging convents are in the United States. (laughs) And by God, I found one. Sight unseen, they took me. The night I entered, I was drunk. They took me anyway, and that says a lot about them. (laughs) And I stayed drunk in that convent for about 15 years. I worked hard. Uh, I'm grateful for that experience, you know, and I believe God never makes a mistake. I was in that place. I wasn't ready for the things that were going to happen. I was protected there and... You know, though all the terrible things I did when I was in there, part of me was trying to be a good sister. I learned about spiritual reading. I studied some of the masters. And there was a part of me, from time to time, I loved the the church music, the classical church music. Now they drag guitars into church. Oh, my God. But in those days, we had a big pipe organ, and I liked nothing better than to get my bottle of booze and get up there and play that sucker until you could. (laughs) One of the women used to say, I love when you're up there, she said. I feel so holy. (laughs) And I said to her, so do I. (laughs) 
mother superior, we got a new one. She was very enlightened. In 15 years, they were starting to put me in psych wards. I've been in psych wards 32 times. Uh, I've had 38 electroshock treatments. I used to get tied to the bed, not for fun and frolic. I, I used to get put in straight jackets. And in those days, they also put me in cold water baths. Had lots of therapy. And I tell you, I really used that whole business um, to its benefit, finally, because I married a psychiatrist. I mean, I knew more psychiatrists than anybody. Anyway, I left the convent well-educated and didn't know a thing. Didn't know a thing that was important because I stood on that convent uh, step thinking, my problems are finished now. Now, you can change my clothes, because in the days I went there, we wore the long black habits, you know, with the rosary at the side and the whole business. And I had taken the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, played around with them as needed. Um, and I was no longer Sister Mary Eugenia. I had my secular name back. And I thought that change was as simple as that. See, later on, I was soon to come into AA, and I thought change was as simple as coming into AA. Park my hiney, somebody's going to transform me, and my life is, I'm, I'm going to be okay. Not so. Well, anyway, I came out of the convent. I needed to drink, and I was, you know, I, I had never had experience of bars because when I came, before I left for the convent, we didn't have bars. We had beer parlors in Saskatchewan. And, you know, you could get hard liquor there, and et cetera. But I found the bars, and I loved the bars. And for the next 10 years, 10 months, thank goodness I wouldn't have survived 10 years. I found the men there, too. And I lived a life of such degradation that I wouldn't even begin to try to tell you what went on in my life. Uh, I got put into jail, and uh, I can tell you that was a new experience for an ex-nun. <laughs> I called for the chief of police, and I said, you can't keep me here. I'm an ex-nun. And he said, I don't care if you're an ex-pope. You're staying here. And he said, my recommendation is you get a damn good lawyer. So um, at the end of that period, I signed myself into 999 Queen Street, which was Toronto's uh, snake pit. I was there two weeks, and my brother came and took me back to Saskatchewan. And uh, I came back. You know, again, I say, God never makes a mistake. We, I make mistakes. God never does. I was to meet my destiny in Saskatoon. I was to meet the man I was going to marry and who brought violence into my life. And I, I also met Dr. Hoffer. If you know the history, you know that Dr. Hoffer at that time was u utilizing LSD to, as, um, a, as a way of treating uh, schizophrenics. And he was having a great deal of success, well, some success with it. But then when, when um, uh, LSD went to the streets, the Orthomolecular Society shut him down. But at that time, he had known Bill Wilson because of his connection to Lois and Bill and to that whole thing. And he went to my doctor and he said, look, he said, we've got a file on her like this. He said, she doesn't have all those mental illnesses. She's alcoholic and should go to AA. I have a brother who was in AA, and when he got sober, my dad cried, and he said, your brother has been transformed. He said, this new organization is on the prairies now. And he said, I don't know what it is. This was back in the early 50s, he told me this. He said, your brother isn't going to die. He's been transformed. And somewhere in my consciousness, I planted that because I was to need that. When Dr. Hoffer said, you should go to AA, my psychiatrist said, oh, we couldn't do that. He said, uh, it would interfere with her treatment. But Dr. Hoffer had enough clout 
<clears throat> Four days later, I found myself in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I wish I could tell you that this is where the story, where the degradation ends. It doesn't. <clears throat> I come into AA, and what sticks in my head is, I'm going to be transformed. This is good. And my dad is going to cry, and he's going to say, Mildred is in great shape. All is well. Didn't happen. I came into AA and parked my hiney. Now, you have to understand who lives up here. This person who lives up here has studied theology. She knows how to explain transubstantiation. She knows how to write essays on all these deep subjects. She thinks she knows it all, and when I hear you mention G-O-D, I shut down, because G-O-D and I aren't that great friends right now. I also think that this is going to be simple. I'm going to come and par- I didn't know anything about change. You have to understand that convents in the early 50s, they were monastic places, You know, you were judged on who you were and how you were by how you you kept the laws and the rules of a community or the church or whatever. And I could do that hands down with nothing happening in here. And so I come and nothing happens in here. I'm waiting for somebody to transform me. Three weeks go by, it doesn't happen. And I don't feel good. I never liked being sober. I couldn't stand being sober. And so I know how to change the way I feel. I sat in AA because I'm not leaving AA. My dad said good stuff happens here, and by God, I want the good stuff. And so I stayed stoned. Don't recommend it to you. (laughs) Those of you that were here last night and you got those nice chips and all that, or books, I guess, uh, and all, you know, It doesn't work that way. I sat here for five and a half years, and um, that's when I met you, Tom. And that's when, you know, Cease Corrigal was big in my life. By the way, those of you that know Cease, the guy who told the story of foot, 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 and foot, 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 uh, he died June 2nd, and we buried him on the 7th. He was 61 years sober, and he was one of the people who truly carried the message in AA. And, God, he was a good man. You know, I don't know how many times he came to 12-step me. And I said to him one time after I was sober, why did you always come? Because I played such lousy games. I'd sign in under a different name and I'd change places and all that kind of stuff. He said, because we never knew when the call was going to be the right one. They came, they never stayed. They just said, when you are ready, we're here. And I always felt loved and I always felt cared for. God, what heroes have walked the way before us and some are still here. So, (laughs) I married that psychiatrist. He too was alcoholic. And um, that's a pair, I'll tell you. And we had a very fancy lifestyle, and I started to drink, because once I left AA, I'm the ultimate loser. I can't even do AA right, for God's sake. Everybody else is sitting here sober. I'm sitting here stoned all the time, and uh, I can't stop. And so I left, and I thought, ah, who needs them? And within two days, I had jumped out of a two-story window, because somebody had locked me into a room. I needed to drink. I jumped out of the two-story window, and I thought it was kind of far down, so I threw a chair down. (laughs) I'm not the smartest bulb in the universe. And jumped. I thought, I'll jump on the chair. It won't be quite so far. (laughs) Well, I jumped on the chair, and I broke both feet, and from there we go to another year and a half of drinking. And if I thought my nose was in the dirt in 1966, I didn't know where bottom was. And I'm grateful for every bit of it because the last three weeks 
of my drinking. I spent lying on a park bench, sitting on a park bench, begging a few, uh, you know, a few shekels, selling my body for a drink, etc. It's not a pretty story. I don't, and you see, God never makes mistakes. My family had hired a private detective, and um, and he and a and a policeman found me on a park bench and took me to the psych ward. And that's where I woke up on the morning of the 18th of May, 1973. And on the 20th of May, the nurse took me to breakfast because I could again walk because I had been paralyzed, had what they called alcoholic poisoning. And uh, she took me to breakfast and I saw myself. Big black eye and big purple mark, teeth knocked out, hair straggly. I weighed about 85 pounds and I said to her, I've become a woman of the streets, haven't I? Imagine that. I come from a family of integrity. I've been in a convent 15 years, and look at me. And she said, yes, you have. What are you going to do about it? And after breakfast, she took me back to my room, and I thought, what am I going to do about it? And I made up my mind. There was nothing else to do. There was nobody I could manipulate. There was nobody I could beg. I couldn't have taken a job. I was broken. And so I knew what I was going to do. I'm out of here. I'm going to take my life. And it wasn't a cry, you know, well, maybe somebody will feel that it was done. I'm out of here. And I asked the nurse to get my clothes, and she went to get my clothes, and the absolutely unexpected happened. And I never want to speak without telling this. As she went out, something happened to me. It was as if a hand reached into me and took the compulsion and the obsession. And I remember standing there thinking, my God, I don't have to drink anymore. I can't tell you how I knew that. I knew it as clearly as I see you sitting there. I don't have to drink anymore. If you had said to me what just happened, I could, I, for years, I wouldn't really, I didn't see what I really believe happened that morning. When I was done, see, often, How many times do we pray to God, and it's not thy will be done, it's my will be done. And you got the power to do it, baby, so let's go. (laughs) You know, and that morning it was, I'm done. I haven't got a clue. Wonderful prayer. And that hand that I believe reached into me was the hand of God. And, And the compulsion was gone, and in 40 years... I've screamed in pain a lot of times, but I've never had the urge to drink. It's just not relevant. And I hope that's for the higher power, not me. And I remember standing there saying, I don't know how to live sober. That was always the kicking point. Often I would think, Maybe it wouldn't be so bad to be sober, but I don't know how to do life sober. You'll have to send me somebody. And there was a rap on the door, and a man stood there, and he said, I came to offer you some help. He said, I think you're probably alcoholic. And I said, yeah, you want to make something of it? He said, no. (laughs) And uh, he took me to Donwood, which was a perfect place for me. They didn't push God, and they didn't push AA. They just took me in for, two, for four weeks, and when I was done, I was homeless. I mean, that just sometimes just shakes me when I say it. I was homeless. I was penniless and friendless and familyless, and um, they gave me enough money to go and get a room I got a room on Skid Row, and I remember, I'd never seen a room like that. I remember oh, just opening the door and saying, oh, and I, I didn't know it then, but I was to live there for a year. And it was one of the best years of my life. Who knows what, all that has to happen? Because I don't think this is just about not drinking. If I am going to be changed inside, something has got to change. And that was the start of it. And the psychiatrist at the hospital said, get a job. I don't know what he thought I was going I took him literally because I would have starved to death. My husband was kind of out of the picture by this time. And um, um, I went from door to door. And after a day and a half, a man said, I've got a factory. He said, you can come and sweep that factory floor. 
You know, it's all this outside stuff, who cares about it? That's what I had to do, and I'm grateful for the poverty that made it necessary for me to get out of bed every morning, regardless of how I felt. You know, I didn't have a radio, I didn't have a television, I didn't have a stereo. I had none of that stuff. I had, I came from the park bench, and I sure had no money to, to get that stuff. And I have to tell you, there was a psychiatrist at Dawnwood. I used to go see him, and he was an angel. You never know when your kindness is the angel that keeps somebody alive until they can hear the music of AA or they can hear the voice of God. He was it for me. I went once a week, and, and for some reason, he, he took a fancy to me. And... Um, after six months, I was there one day, and a man invited me to a meeting. I wasn't going to AA, and uh, he said, you want to come to a meeting? And I didn't know where we were going, but since I hadn't had many invitations lately, I went with him, and we went to this meeting of AA. I don't remember a thing about it except this. I was impressed by what I saw. I saw little groups of people who were nice to each other. Imagine, they were talking about going to lunch. And I thought, I wonder, if I were to come back, I wonder if it could ever be possible that somebody would ask me to lunch. I didn't know. And then another miracle happened. Before I left, you have to understand, I was a mess, and I didn't have pretty clothes and whatever. And somebody came to me and said, Keep, please come back. And I thought, what do they want me to come back for? I'm a broken human being. Anyway, I kept coming back, and I got a sponsor. She had blonde hair, gold earrings, and a white suit. Aren't those brilliant qualifications? <laughs> She was drunk within four months, but she had taught me something. She carried a message to me. She used to say, you can stay sober despite what anybody else does. My husband used to show up sometimes, and there was great violence. And that shows again who I was. I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't go to a lawyer. I didn't go to the police. I just buried and hoped that Nothing worse was going to happen. So anyway, my first sponsor got drunk, and there were two men at that meeting who came to me and said, you know, Mildred, you're too sick to stay here if you don't do the steps. They weren't my sponsors. I didn't have a sponsor. She got drunk. I didn't know. And so they said, if you come early, we'll read the book to you, and we'll do the steps with you. And that's how I did the steps. And I thank them because that's why. I'm a great believer. If you will be willing and just do, let somebody take you through that process and do what you're told, which is exactly what I did. I changed somewhat. You know, I wasn't transformed. I, I don't know. Maybe that's a form of transformation. I was able to stay. And what I really got out of doing the steps was this. You're not my problem. I'm the mess in the middle of all of that. I'm the one that has to change. And so I, I started going to AA and uh, because of that experience, I often, you know, sometimes if people are willing at least not to drink, I'll take them through the steps because I have an unbelievable faith that God's grace works through that process. And if you can take a thimble full, a thimble full will keep you here till you can grab for a cupful or a pailful or whatever it is that you need. That's how it went with me. One year, I'm uh, sweeping the factory floor, and the voice said, look for a teaching job in the paper. I looked. There were three advertised. I phoned, and within 24 hours, I had a job. You talk about God shots. I was still quite crazy. <laughs> and 
you know, to go into a classroom with adolescents is crazy when you're crazy yourself. It was a very interesting experience, and I got, I got a new sponsor. By the way, Clancy, I'll talk to you about him. He's very, very ill. And um, he didn't care about whether I liked what he said. He said, I've done the steps. He said, I have, and I respected him. He was strong, and he said, I'll tell you how, he said, we'll go through the steps again, and he said, if you do what I tell you, according to the book, he said, you will grow some more, and he said, if you don't do that, he said, don't call me again, because I can't fix you. Pretty strong words. I once went to see a minister. He listened to me for five minutes. I had gone all the way to Kansas City to talk to this minister. He listened to me for five minutes, and he said, Mildred, he said, excuse me. He said, I can't fix you, but he said, there's one who can. Will you sit with me in the silence? And I said, yes, and that's what I went to Kansas for. That This is out of context, but it's the same kind of idea. No human power could fix what was wrong with me. Human people have contributed. They have allowed to themselves to be channels, and they have talked to me, and they have done for me, and shown me, and held my hand, and held me when I couldn't, couldn't you know, seem to go on. But through that process, it has been the grace of God, and that's why we get to step 10 and 11. The first seven years that I was sober, my sponsor insisted I pay off my debts. I paid off the husband's debts, too, and I paid off our debts. Because I come from a family where to have a clean name is really important, and I got that done. And... Um, at the end of that time, I had saved nothing. And uh, one day, a God shot. One of the teachers said, come over. She said, we're going to show you how to buy a house. I said, no, you won't. I don't have any money. I keep thinking somebody's walking behind me. <laughs> uh, this one's much better behaved. <laughs> Um, where was I? <laughs> Buying houses. And uh, she said, come and we'll show you how. And within seven days, eight days, I had bought my first house. I tell you this because my first 20 years in sobriety, I was a good member of AA. If you saw me, you know, I was going to meetings. I had a home group. I had a sponsor. I was sponsoring. I was reading the book. Sometimes they'd even ask me to come and speak at conferences and that kind of thing. And, uh, but you know what? I didn't have a prayer practice. I mean, God was kind of a problem for me. Not kind of a problem, a big problem. When you talked about God and you talked about prayer, what's the use? God, I prayed more than you did. We used to do six hours of spiritual exercises every day. Look what happened to me. And what I didn't understand was I wasn't praying. I was giving God instructions. And that doesn't work so well. But I didn't know that. And uh, so that first 20 years, my energy went into success. It went into making money. It went into men, sex. Did I say that? Yes, I did. <laughs> um, having a good time. <laughs> All at the same time. <laughs> and, but that's, I didn't have, I wasn't there. You know, and if you're at that place, where you go to meetings, I really get that, where you don't have the discipline or the desire or the whatever to have a spiritual practice. That was me the first 20 years. 18 years I'm sober, and I'm sitting in my, I had my own house built because I used to buy and sell houses, and I made a lot of money. 
this kid who used to sleep on the park bench, and now I'm buying and selling houses, I have my career, life is good on the outside. Except I'm sitting on my custom designed furniture balling. I don't, I'm not okay. This hasn't answered it in here. And somebody took me through the steps again, and I started to unravel. And at 20 years, I gave up the teaching job, and at 20 years, I gave up the, the man, and um, found myself really depressed, really depressed. 21 years I'm into this, and I'm going to some of the older members, and they're saying, go to more meetings. Well, you know, you can sit at meetings all you like, and if nothing is changing in here, and nothing was changing in here. And uh, one day, God never makes a mistake, the phone rang. And it was a Jesuit saying, um, I'd like you to come and give a retreat. And I just laughed. I said, you don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> he said, yeah, I know who I'm talking to. See, the things that I plan... This is how my life has to go. No, it doesn't. I don't know who I'm the angel for. I know this. Each one of us, at some point in our lives, we have to be the angel for somebody else. And we don't always have to know who it is. And sometimes we have no idea how our kindness and how a smile and how whatever it is we do helps. And, uh, you know, the ego says, oh, crap. Excuse me. You know, I want to do big stuff. I want to do the heroic stuff. Well, maybe that's not what my angelness is about. So uh, I said, you know, I've been excommunicated. And he said, I don't care. Somebody had been talking to him. I didn't even know that person who had been watching me and said, you know, she's got this and that, and I think she'd be good at giving retreats. That was the last thing on my mind that I would ever have considered was that I would give retreats. And it's almost become like another, another career for me. The day that I finished the retreat to 70 women, another big thing happened. I, you know, I've had over my life a real problem with women. <laughs> surprise, surprise. They were the competition. So why would I like you? And you always seemed prettier than me. You always seemed more self-confident than whatever, whatever. I just didn't like you that much. <laughs> and so uh, men was a different thing. And I knew how to shed a strategic tear or two before a man because it helped me get my way. You're such suckers. <laughs> Maybe I've just spoiled it for every woman in the place. <laughs> anyway, I'm standing there in front of this group of 70 women, and I ball. And I started to ball. And it's a big piece of my life because I stood in front of those women, and words came out of my mouth I couldn't have stopped. And what I was saying was, I haven't got a friend in the world. I have many acquaintances, but I am the loneliest person in the world. And I just bawled. And it was as if the walls came tumbling down. I, I can't describe it any other way. It was as if a piece of me just cracked, crumbled, and dropped, and I stood there defenseless. And... Um, I got a great deal of respect for women that day because they came forward and said, could we have a cup of coffee? I didn't know how to be real. I knew how to live from my world of pretense. I knew how to be the person I've described to you. But to sit down with you and listen to you and be present to you, I could pretend, but in the meantime, I'm thinking, what am I going to say that's going to sound good to them? But to be present and truly listen to you and let my heart open, that's, the, that's been what the last 20 years have been about. And um, 
that was huge because I went through another period where I felt broken open. And it was about this time where I was about 21 years sober. And I was thinking suicide because, you know, sometimes people say, you shouldn't say this. Why not? This is real. This is the truth. That's how I felt. You know, make no mistake, because you come and sit on a chair here doesn't fix what's going on in here. And sometimes I felt I don't fit, everybody else seems okay, and all of that stuff. And through this business of the walls coming down, and you know, they didn't come down an hour too late or an hour too early. You know, sometimes people, when I say this, they come and say, will you help me take the walls down? No, I won't. Because if you t if those walls come down, you've got to live without walls. And maybe you're not strong enough to live without walls. That's not my call. For me, that's what happened. And so I started to give retreats, and I started to hear the music of AA. Listen to it. We have been rocketed into the fourth dimension. Spiritual principles would solve all my problems. On page 55, it says... Deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. We found the great reality deep within us. You know, we talk a lot about service and this and that. This is here, too. What does it mean? You know, I've heard people at meetings say, and I probably did it, too. Well, you know, what's that fourth dimension stuff? I don't know what that means. It's key to who we are. Like, who am I when I talk to you? Who are you when I relate to you? Are you just a set of atoms and molecules that one day are no longer going to be useful to you and we're going to bury that piece of you? Who's left? You know, one of the great, I, I love some of the great mystics and what they had to say. You know, uh, Meister Eckhart, 800 years ago, he said, the soul grows by subtraction. As the ego is taken away, what is left is, is this, this uh, essence. Eckhart Tolle, a modern-day mystic, he talks about the essence of us, that it's whole and complete. That's why I'm excited about step 11 and 12, at 10 and 11, because that's what I have to remember. One of my teachers put it this way to me. He said <clears throat> he was talking about growing in God consciousness. What is our program about? Is it about running around? Step 11 says, or 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result, not one of many, the result that's what happens through doing the steps. He said, we wake up spiritually. What does that mean? Well, Bill put it in a way that could be accepted, but I know that Bill wrote a letter to a woman in 1956. I have a copy of it. She, her husband had died, and this is what he said to her. I really empathize with you, he said. I used to believe that the purpose of life was happiness. And I don't believe that any more. He said, I believe the purpose of life is growth in God consciousness. And he said, through that, per that process, there will be times when you will feel okay. And then it'll be time again to keep on growing. And that, to me, is what the cycle of life is all about. There are days I feel I've got wings. And there are days where I feel, uh-uh, not today, bud. <laughs> One of my teachers put it this way. He said, he had me bring two candles when I had a counseling session with him. And so he took the one candle into the other room and then came back. And he said, all right, let's light both of the candles. So I lit the one, and that was good. It gave light and it gave heat, and he said, now light the other one. 
and I couldn't because what he had done was remove the wick. And there was this candle. It had the capacity to give light and heat, but it couldn't do it because it needed a wick. And he said, maybe that's the way you need to think about yourself. You, Mildred, out there trying to make things happen, that's good. But if you want it to be from God consciousness, if you want the energy of God, if you want the energy of the fourth dimension to be present, see, he said, then you need a wick. You need God consciousness. I need to remember that the essence of you is God and the essence of me is God. And then from that level, see, who else knew that was Einstein. Einstein put it this way. He said, you'll never fix a problem at the level it was created. And at what level are all problems created? I create mine, you know where. At the level of the false self, at the level of ego. Me, I got to have my way. You've got to do what I want and all of that. And you see, that to me is, is where this has has taken me. I began to hear the music of AA. And there's another statement. Imagine this one. Spiritual principles would solve all my problems. I said to myself, you got to be kidding. <laughs> the first time I read that, I needed a man. You mean spiritual <laughs> principles are going to deliver one to me? I don't think so. And, and it says, that's what this book is about to help you find the power that will solve your problem the first time my sponsor had me read that I, I kept saying problems because I thought I had problems and he made me read it until I saw it, it says problem and you know Katie went after it yesterday morning so beautifully the problem is self that's the root of the problem. And as long as I think life has to go my way, what does that mean? If life isn't going to go my way, what is that third step about? And you see, where I think this, this gets interesting then, uh, these last 19 years have been learning, growing, seeing things different. I used to be so restless, irritable, and discontented. I just didn't know how to be at peace. I always wanted something to be going on. I always needed somebody in my life, and we got to be doing things, and i got to be on the go. I've learned to be peaceful. I've learned to be quiet. And through that process, I've learned to meditate. I don't recommend, you know, step 11 says that through prayer and meditation, we're going to grow in conscious contact with God. Part of the change for me at 21 years was this. I knew that I had to get right with God, and I knew that I had to learn to meditate. And if I didn't, I wasn't going to make it. I can't tell you how I knew that. I'm not saying that to you. I'm saying that to me. See, I knew, how am I going to pray? I'll talk about that first. I had lots of experience at praying to God and giving God his marching orders, and it didn't work. I don't pray that way anymore. I believe today. I don't know how, what else to call myself, but really, in essence, I think we're God beings. Because if that essence is within us, I surely can't be this form. That's how I appear. You know, Eckhart Tolle talks about that. He doesn't use the term God. He said, you know, so many people have so much baggage. He talks about the form, my form, you call Mildred, that's not going to last forever, but the formless which is within me. And I think that's what Einstein was referring to when he said at one point, he said, we're in trouble on the planet. 
after the atom was split. And he said, we better get it right. He said, there's only one of us here. There's only one life force in all these different bodies. And that's where I think kindness and compassion and goodness come in. That's why I need the wick in my candle so that I remember that this wick, this light force within me moves the energy up to the fourth dimension. And then we've got a solution. You know, it's the old business. Once I make one mistake from a level of consciousness, I make two. I get the third man. I get the fourth man. We keep doing this dance. And it's all the same process because I haven't changed. And once you go to the fourth dimension, you're talking a different level. You know, um, I'm going to interrupt this just a minute. I had my 40th anniversary and in Toronto. We have a big meeting and if you, people, lots of people came. And I invited some of my colleagues from my professional life who had never been to an AA meeting and they really liked me. And so I said, you know, I'm having a big celebration. I said, would you like to come? Because they know I travel a great deal. And uh, they said, yes. So after the meeting, their response, God, I love to see AA through the eyes of somebody like these women. Lovely, good, decent women, professional to the core and open to new ideas. And uh, one of them called me the next day and she said, we cried all the way home. I said, why? <laughs> because... You just was the speaker, and you just has a pretty shady life. And he talked about being, you know, on the street and taking drugs, et cetera, et cetera. They said, why do you people laugh like you do? <laughs> Two days later, Mary and I are standing in a parking lot, and the tears are rolling down her cheeks. She said, I still feel so sorry for him. <laughs> So, we are not a glum lot. I tried to explain that to them. And uh, I had them over for lunch on Thursday before I came here. And uh, I, they had so many questions. But the interesting part was this. These are women who have dedicated their lives to service in one way or another. They're mostly retired now. But, you know, they make pots of food and take it to the homeless downtown and that kind of stuff. And one of the last things they said before we said goodbye was this. And they all agreed that being at that meeting influenced them profoundly. God's grace is something else. And they said, you know, one, one of them, one after the other said, you know, I went home and I thought about my life. What am I doing for other people to make life, to, to put out goodness and so on? You know, I think they're pretty good living women, but that's the effect that meeting had on them. Powerful. Anyway, I'm, I, I better get going. Because uh, there's something else I want to say. You know... Step 10, I haven't forgotten about it. Step 10 kind of went, got a short shrift of me, too, because I'm busy making money, I'm busy doing whatever. You know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, there's something specific, 10, 11, and 12, how do you do those? The last 20 years have been rich in my life. 10 has become really crucial to me because it's connected to 11. It has become important to me to meditate. It has become important. I might as well tell the truth. You know, maybe you don't want to know what my spiritual practice is. I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, in step 10, he says we have a daily reprieve, dependent on our spiritual condition. Well, my spiritual condition, I believe God is here all the time, but I'm not always aware of it. So that's what becomes 
the, the work as I see it. And then he goes on to say that we remember during the day, uh, what is the exact uh, expression, because it's, it's so great. He says we have, we're headed for trouble if we rest on our laurels, for alcohol is a subtle foe. What we really have is a daily reprieve. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all our activities. Make sure we have the wick in the candle. And then he goes on to say, how can I best serve thee? For those first 20 years, my attitude wasn't that. It was, how can you best serve me? And it doesn't work that way. Thy will, not mine, be done. These thoughts must go with us constantly. Now, how am I going to pull that off? And then also he says, it's the proper use of the will. Thank God for will, not self-will. Will is a gift of God. If you didn't have the gift of will, you couldn't make choices. Then you're at the mercy of everybody. I have got the capacity to say yes. There's only one I don't have. The book says I've lost the power of choice in drink. Accept that. But otherwise, I can say yes. And that's what the glory of living is. How am I going to carry that with me constantly? Well, somebody suggested to me, Um, that he was trying to make every day a masterpiece. I don't know if you read this in in, uh, Pennsylvania, but in Toronto we read a piece called Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. We don't have yesterday, we don't have tomorrow. All we have is today. Actually, all I have is this breath. And how am I going to carry the vision of God's, you know, carry that with me constantly? And this minister said, I try to make every day a masterpiece. And I thought, isn't that a great idea? I like pictures. You know, we can talk ideas, but when I've got pictures, so I I picture I've got this great big wall that I'm going to finish before I die, and every day I'm going to put something on there. And how am I going to do that? You know, if I don't have some structure in my life, chances are I'm just going to wander through the day. And if you please me, I'll have a nice day. And if you don't please me, God help you and God help me. (laughs) So what I do in the morning to combine steps, I meditate in the morning, I do my spiritual reading, and then I spend about 10 minutes thinking about my day. And I write down five things I'm going to do. For example, before I leave my home, before I put the unlock the door, I'm going to remember I'm a God being, and I'm going to carry that energy with me to everybody that I meet to the best of my ability. Number two, when I go to the grocery store, before I take a look and judge everybody, as Katie was talking about. I'm right there with you, Katie. (laughs) They never do it right. Uh, I'm going to remember. I'm a God being, and they're God beings. You know, nobody ever said, the master when he was here, he never said we have to like everybody. He said we have to love everybody. And love isn't a hormonal situation. It's a decision that we make. I see who you are, and I'm going to treat you accordingly. And then my step 10, do I think about God all day long? No, I don't think that's real. But the perfume of that carries with me. And then at night, I take that book, and I'm not proud because five times I've made five, I keep it to five, and sometimes I've done two very well, sometimes I've forgotten the other three, sometimes I've done the other three half-assed, and so, so it goes. But I know that the next day I'm going to work on my, my masterpiece again to the best of my ability. Some black strokes go on and some gray strokes, but I also get some nice light in there and some good things that happen. And, and then I meditate. 
what do I do? Because somebody's always going to ask me this, what do I do to men? You know, when I started out in, at 21 years, because, you know, we'd been taught all kinds of things in the convent. Tried that, didn't work. You know, in the convent I was always drunk, and that doesn't work so well when you're trying to meditate. <laughs> you can feel very holy, but it doesn't take you very far. And um, I've just learned it. So I took some courses, and... I like the, the Eric Butterworth, who was a great teacher of mine. He was from New York City. And he talked about, he said, you don't really need a method to meditate. He said, your soul will find the method that it works best with. And I have found the me- I just sit in the silence. I do my spiritual reading before, and then I say, God, this is your time. I'm getting out of here. I'm just going to be present and be still. And those, that's my spiritual practice. So, I have to say, I, uh, to say that I'm grateful just doesn't cut it. Because I have a life. The little girl that I was, I used to say I'm an oddball. And that's the way I'm going to live, and that's the way I'm going to die. And I really believe that. I am not an oddball today. You may not like my language, but I believe today that I'm a God being living in these atoms and molecules we call Mildred. And I believe that's who you are too. And my commitment is to do the best I can in the life that I have left to express that in as much goodness as I can. You have... Ah, I'm going to tell you one story. (laughs) It's a story in a book by Theophane the Monk. It's a book called The Magic Mountain. If you don't like weird, don't buy it. (laughs) If you like weird, if you like metaphors, you might want to take a look at it because there are little stories in there and uh, you read them and say, what does that mean? I'm going to tell you just one. It'll just take two minutes. A a man went to the magic monastery one day, and he said to the head monk, I want to become a monk. And the head monk said, what kind of monk do you want to become? And the man said, I want to become a real monk. At which point, the, the head monk gave him a glass of red wine, which he drank. And as he drank that red wine, something unbelievable happened. A crystal globe formed over that monk, who had formerly looked like just an ordinary man, and what he saw was a being of beauty and light. And he was amazed, and he said, I wonder if he knows how beautiful he is. Maybe I should tell him. And when he tried to speak, the red wine had burnt out his tongue. And he said, oh, well, it's worth the sacrifice. And then he made an amazing realization that that crystal globe, when he wanted to use that crystal globe, anybody that came toward him changed from being just ordinary people and he saw them as incredibly beautiful and lovely. And he knew that that is what he had come for. And if nobody has told you today that you are incredibly beautiful and lovely, let me be the one to do so. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.